How are you? I'm not sure about that. How are you really? Thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Colin Robertson. I'm the curator of education here at the museum and glad to have you here tonight. It's kind of a, I grew up on an Indian reservation in southwestern South Dakota and we're starting on what looks like Indian time and also punk music time, I think. <laughs> um, it's also a little bit scary to tell people that there's no hooch in the hall at some event associated with the punk music scene. Um, <laughs> So I had to tell people, you know, enjoy your drink fast now. You'll, you'll thank me later. And uh, we're just delighted to have you here tonight uh, for a really special opportunity. Um, no, what better place than downtown Reno to have Kevin Seconds here tonight? I want to just say thanks so much for coming out and for um, celebrating this kind of culture in Reno, which there is a... Reno, I don't know if you saw the Huffington Post today, but there is a story in the Huffington Post today about why Reno is really cool. And it has everything to do with what Kevin Seconds did here and everything to do with what's happening here now. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, Alicia Funkhauser, the talented Director of Programs for the Holland Project is going to just welcome everyone and then we'll get started. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. All right, thanks for coming again tonight, guys. Um, before we get started, I want to let you know tonight we're kicking off some great exhibitions that we have through the Holland Project, one of which the Skino Show over at Holland Project, which is kind of a retrospective of the roots of punk rock in our city and um, all the amazing things that came out of that scene. So definitely come and join us tomorrow night at Holland Project, 6 o'clock, for the opening reception for that. And then also another tie-in to this event, we also have some amazing work by um, Chris Carnell and Kevin Cox over at our micro gallery, which is located at Bebo, um, just south of the university. Um, and both of these exhibitions will be up from now through September 4th. So we'd love for you guys to come and check them out. And without further ado, Kevin Seconds. <laughs> hey. Ooh. So, uh, well, okay, so uh, I've, I sort of make a living talking into a microphone or shouting into a microphone, but uh, the few times I've actually just talked without loud music behind me, it's been uh, fun which is completely uh, d d d nauseating and it's just crazy. So uh, I'm going to try. My wife gave me some good tips, and I think I'm going to try to remember those as I talk about this crazy stuff. So thank you guys for being here. This is uh, just, well, first of all, just seven seconds played at Knitting Factory just not long ago. And uh, just for the fact that we were playing at this legit venue in the middle of downtown Reno, you know, with all the, all the casinos and, the, you know, the places that we worked as when we were younger and got kicked out when we were even younger and all that stuff. It was a, it was a little weird, but we got a chance to walk around a little bit and just see what how Reno's turned out. And it, it's it's pretty amazing. Like, it's all the things that I think we used to sort of sit around and dream about when we were kids, you know, the art scene and the music and everything flourishing. So thank you, you know, kudos to everybody who's still here making things happen in this city because there was a time I just didn't, I wasn't convinced that, that it could happen. You know, I thought, no, they don't want anything new and fresh and exciting. They just want the same old thing. So it's all happening now. And so thank you guys. And thanks for, I'm glad Reno is, is, is doing as well as it is. It seems like it's doing great. So good, good job. Um, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to, I mean, I know what I'm supposed to talk about, but I'm not sure how to kickstart this stuff off. I guess the best way I can do it is just to sort of try to very quickly give, uh, give a little history background as to me and, and what sort of got me to embrace punk rock music in general. Um, I grew up and my family lived in Sacramento. Uh, we moved to Reno in 1977. And um, we literally, for the first two weeks that we lived here, we lived out of a car. Uh, <laughs> this isn't going to be that story. I'm just going to, I just want to give you a background. We lived in a car at uh, Paradise Park 
And uh, my mom and I got jobs at McDonald's, and uh, she became a manager. I, I didn't make it. I quit before I could be a manager. But um, we were living, we then moved to a hotel, a motel on uh, Prater in Sparks called the Western Motel. And we lived there for, for many months. And I won't, the background is crazy and it's too convoluted. But one night we were all sitting around the, uh, the black and white TV set at our room, and there was a special on. Uh, the, the explosion, the explosive punk rock scene in, in, in England, and there was all of this crazy footage of the Sex Pistols and the Clash and, and stuff. And I remember my mom just going, what the hell is this? You know, this is crazy. And uh, I just remember looking over at my little brother, Steve, uh, Steve Youth, who's the bass player for Seven Seconds, of course. Uh, he was probably 10, and I just remember looking over at him, and, th and he was looking at me like, right? This is something, right? This is... And uh, we just, I don't know, that little teeny, maybe two, three, four minute, uh, it, was a, it was a news show on NBC, I remember. I think it was called Weekend or Weeknight or something. And uh, of course, it was very sens sensationalistic and it was, you know, nuts, but it, it, we, it sparked something in us. So um, we were like, okay, and we, we know it's called punk rock. We've heard this, a bit about this band called the Sex Pistols. We've heard of the Clash. The Ramones, what now, you know? And at the time, there really weren't any record stores in town that would even sell that stuff. We'd go to, there used to be Eucalyptus Records. Does anyone remember, remember Eucalyptus Records? <laughs> over in Sparks. And we'd go over there, and we would just, I mean, we would pester them so endlessly. Like, please carry punk rock. And they didn't even know what punk rock was. They'd go, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, you know. And... Um, so it was just a, we just we we got the bug and we just did everything we possibly could at these as these bored kids growing up in Reno to try to find out what this crazy elusive mysterious evil dark fun thing punk rock you know how, how what it, what it, what we could do uh, how we could connect ourselves to it. Um, and I do have notes here by the way I have to just in case. Um, so. Uh, eventually, uh, Eucalyptus started to carry, they, they, had, they had what they called a, uh, an import section. And it, even if it was American Records, they just for some reason put it in the import section. I never understood that. And um, I remember going there and I just saw a uh, seven inch by the band, an uh, English band called X-Ray Specs. The song was Oh Bondage Up Yours. And I was like, I didn't even care what it sounded like. I just looked so friggin' cool. I just said, I'm buying it. And I bought it, took it home, and it was just, that was it. That was like, uh, that's all I needed is just to hear this woman, young woman, just, you know, sh shrieking and this out of tune saxophone and the guitars are loud. And I was just like, you know, this is, I'm a kid growing up on, Le you know, Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple and Black Sabbath. And, and, uh, and all of a sudden that music became so incredibly irrelevant. And just it, all of a sudden I realized that, that, that this music that I'm now being introduced to, um, spoke more to me and it just felt more accessible. It felt more like something that I could do. I remember seeing footage of the Ramones playing and you know there was kid there were kids like two feet from them and you could see the sweat and spit and everything flying and I'm like I'd been to arenas and stadiums. I saw Judas Priest at the Centennial Coliseum and I just remember thinking, I'm they don't know I'm here. I don't exist, you know? So to see that and it was so new then, and this was also at the time when disco was just the big thing. You know, disco was very big, and so um, it was it was it was so uh, mind-numbingly huge for us, and we just couldn't get enough of it. So we craved to try to find that and and be closer to it. Um, real quick, like also, so so I'm going to try to figure out how to tie, <laughs> tie in me to. The Reno, what what became the the early sort of thing of the the Reno punk rock scene. Uh, we were just talking about this earlier, and a, a big catalyst I think was uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show, because I was at the Granada, right, which was just n not far from here. And was it Friday, Saturday night? Yeah. One of those, Saturday night, and we would go. My, my family and Sue, we, we would just, I mean, sometimes that was like the only thing to look forward to. I remember that would, we, that's all we would look forward to. Like, whatever was going on in school or with jobs or whatever, uh, we knew that Rocky Horror uh, Picture Show would be the place that we could go and not be made fun of, not be called names, you know, because we looked a little different or we thought a little differently. Um, and once you were in, it was great, because it was just chaos going on inside, and you knew what was happening, you knew what was gonna happen, but it just, every, every night was, every time it happened, it was special and, and, and weird, and it just felt good that it was going on in Reno. Because back then, of course, 
late 70s, everything was very, it just felt very rep repressive, you know? It felt like if you had new ideas, young ideas that, that no one really wanted to know. I, I got called uh, faggot for buying Kiss records, you know? Like I remember the, you know, my friends thought it was just, I was an alien for, for even thinking about buying this kind of stuff. And so for me, you know, to have that sort of celebrated every Friday night or Saturday night, whatever it was, it was, it was pretty great. And so we would do that. And that was the first time I ever saw Bessie. <laughs> and Joan, and they would be part of the show. And we kept saying, who are those crazy girls? Where do they come from? Like, do they, do they, do they ship them in from another city? Like, they, they live in Reno? Like, <laughs> it, it really felt like that. Because, you know, when you, when you uh, did see other people that, that sort of could have, I guess, you know, maybe I did think of myself as a freak or something, but when you saw other people that were sort of crazy and wild and colorful and didn't uh, embrace what was mainstream and typical, you just, you, you gravitated toward them and you wanted to get to know them and stuff. So that was huge for at least a summer. We would just do that every, every weekend and, and um, I don't know if we got to know you guys. I don't think we really met then or not. It just, it was kind of a thing. And then uh, the next thing I remember being massive, at least in terms of punk rock in Reno, was when the Ramones played. The Ramones came through one year, they were on a tour with Eddie Money of all things. Eddie Money. At the time, Eddie Money was like, he was riding on two tickets to paradise. <laughs> and um, and I, I just hated it. I hated everything that was on the radio. I hated people that, that would try to talk me into like buying that music. And, and I know it sounds narrow-minded, and it was, but I just, all I wanted was punk, more punk, more punk, 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 you know? Even New Wave was too, not, not, it was too not enough for me. So, um, We'd heard wor the word, we saw the poster, and I, I remember calling somebody just constantly going, are you sure it's the, like the Ramones, like the band from New York with the tattered jeans? And, and it was so, we couldn't even wait. We couldn't, and, and I didn't believe it was going to happen. I thought it was going to, I knew it was going to get canceled before it ever got started. But sure enough, that night, uh, when was it? I wrote it down, December 29th, 1978. December 29th, 1978. Um, uh, we all, we showed up at the uh, Livestock, was it Livestock Pavilion Live Event Center? There was two. There was, I remember I saw Van Halen in the small one. And, you know, Pat Travers was over in the big one. I don't know, anyway. <laughs> but the Ramones played, and uh, they, sh you know, they, they, they were there. So we got in line, and we fought to get to the front of the line. And uh, I realized that, it, that ev eventually that all the people that were standing and the ones that were the most fierce and adamant about getting in line and, and getting in the front of the line were the kids who wanted to hear punk rock. They were there for the Ramones, not Eddie Money. All the, there, were, there were a lot of girls clutching Eddie Money albums and, and wearing Eddie Money t-shirts, and I'm like, well, they're going to hate the Ramones. There's no way they're going to like the Ramones. So we were just all kind of uh, sort of congregating and, and sort, of, sort of looking at each other, like sizing each other up like, what's your deal? Where are you from? And uh, it was then that we actually met... Uh, some a couple guys who became sort of the, the well the one of the bands that came out of Carson City the Yobs as far, as far as I know the band that came out of uh, Carson at the time that was doing like underground punk rock music um, those guys we met that night at the Ramones show and we were all like where are you guys from oh we're from here where are you from we're from Carson City you drive from Carson City to see the Ramones that's great uh, same thing happened with the Tahoe kids, all the South Lake Tahoe kids who, who really were instrumental in a big part of the Reno, early Reno punk rock sh uh, scene days. Um, they were all there too, Troy, our drummer, and, and Spiz, the singer for Urban Assault, Troy's old punk band. And, and uh, so that was such a big thing, getting in and, and actually seeing the Ramones rock. And, and every one of us since then have talked about it. And we're like, no, no, I know Joey was looking at me and they, they were pointing at me. And I know when, when Dee Dee flicked his pick, it was for, meant for me. Like we all, we were there because we thought it was like, it was our experience and we were there for the, the Ramones and the Ramones were, were there for us. And when you think about it now, the Ramones probably don't even, didn't even remember Reno after. Because, you know, then it was like, it really was like all the big name bands came through Reno and stuff, but to have the Ramones play. So, um, but yeah, so I guess that's, that's sort of in a nutshell how it all started uh, for me. And in terms of Reno, I think that show in itself was enough for me to believe that we were, we needed, we needed to do something. My, little bro my, my little brother, Steve and I, had been trying to start a band, and for a while it was going to be like a, I remember we were really big in the New York Dolls, and so we were thinking, all right, we'll be a glam rock band. But then it was like, well, that means we have to 
you know, wear makeup and dress up and and we don't look that good in makeup and it's not going to work and who's going to book us in Reno and you know and New Wave was a little too light for me and, and Steve so we we're, were like it's got to be punk it's got to be punk like you know but we were also like really big on not trying to sound like anybody else that we loved you know bands like the uh, like the Pistols and the Ramones but also a lot of the West Coast stuff like uh, the Dills and X and DOA and the Avengers these were bands that we were starting to get records by and starting to get influenced by and so it just it just seemed like we were whenever we practiced we were always trying to like sort of take what we got from them but also like change it a little bit so that we, we didn't sound exactly like them. If I hear and when I listen to demo tapes from that era I, we we sounded exactly like those bands like we I was we were talking you know there's on the film that you guys will see there's a a, a song an old seven second song demo that's used and. Uh, we weren't even totally sure that it was me singing. It was, it was like, it was my, I was going through my Joey shithead days where I was like, rah, 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 and it's pretty funny. But anyway, um, so we had the spark to start a band, and we didn't have any idea. There was really nobody that we knew who wanted to play the kind of music or even played an instrument. We would try to, we'd put ads out in music stores, and, and they, people would yank them down because, you know, they probably saw the word punk and thought, screw that, you know. Um, and we just had a tough time. It was like uh, just trying to find anybody that would want to try to be, be in a band with us was 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 like crazy. And um, so um, we did find a guy named Bob Seeds who played drums, and he was like a rocker dude, stoner dude. And we just begged him to be in the band. We just just who cares if you don't like the music? Just be in our band. <laughs> so, and he was like he and I worked together at um, Montgomery Ward on back when there was a Montgomery Ward. <laughs> We, we worked in the, he worked in the hardware department, I worked in the garden shop slash toy department. And, uh, and I think I bought a guitar at Montgomery Ward that would not stay in tune. It looked like a skinny Les Paul and I was just so excited just to get that. But uh, we, we got the band going, sort of. We played in our living room a lot and we played in front of my mom and her friends and uh, we decided, we, had, we went through a bunch of names. We, first we were called the Misfits and then we were devastated when we found out there was another band called the Misfits. And, uh, and assumed that they would just go nowhere because, you know. <laughs> but we, 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 we came up with this name X-Band, and I thought it just sounded controversial and scary. And so we became X-Band. We drew up a label. We drew up fake record covers. We did, I mean, we were just, it was insane and delusional. And, but still, there was no, there was nothing to do with it because, A, we were underage. No bar was going to book us. Um, we didn't have cool friends that would invite us to play their keg, kegger parties. So it was pretty much all happening um, on Patton Drive, that's where we live. We lived at, at my mom's crappy apartment, uh, 2302 Patton Drive. And uh, we just drive our neighbors crazy and my mom crazy and everybody crazy. Um, so yeah, um, that, it, that was 1979. Uh, Bob Seeds went to the Navy. He tried to talk me for weeks, tried to talk me into joining the Navy with him. I almost did and then I said, nope, I can't do it. And uh, he left, and my brother and I were back to where we were, where like, which was like, we're never going to find a drummer. And then one day, we, he and I were over at Eucalyptus Records and Sparks, and uh, we're, we're looking through the few rec record, you know, punk records that they had, and we see this dude with long hair, beard. He's wearing a dirty, dingy parka. He's got like a white t-shirt. He's got like buttons everywhere. And I was like, wow. This, I thought he was like a hippie biker guy. I said, look at that hippie biker guy. Look. He's got buttons. Who who wears who wears buttons? You know, no, you don't. So we we're like trying to be really cool and walk up to the the rack across from him, and and I see a, a I see a DOA button, and I think I, I think it was an X-ray sp specs button, and I was just like, I was like, hey man, w w w you know, w where are you from? And he's like, and you know, this is if you know Tom, the guy that I'm talking about, you can he's just like, like what's it to you, you know, and uh, we're like. We start talking, and it turns out that he lives in town, and, and he's a huge fan of punk rock, and has like the biggest record collection that you could ever imagine. Like he had records that of bands that uh, that I'd heard of, and then bands that I couldn't, you know, I would later hear of. And we must have stayed at Eucalyptus Records for like two hours just talking about uh, bands he'd seen, bands we wish we'd seen, and uh, he he says, hey. You know, come over to, to my friend Cliff's house, and he, he, he has a bunch of records too. So we went over and uh, to Cliff's, Cliff Barnell, and uh, listened to the records, and 
just spent the entire night just listening to all these great records and just being mind blown like every five minutes of just going how did I not hear these guys you know these guys are from San Francisco they're not even from England or New York they're from San Francisco um, meanwhile there's a band who had been playing who were being sort of booked as new wave called Bellevue they're playing in town in in Reno and uh, did, did you guys ever see Bellevue I mean prior to like before everything started happening like like they were playing they were playing like they played the Sparks Public Library like they somehow got a gig isn't that funny like they actually got a re they got a gig at the Sparks Public Library who who can pull that off that's the most punk thing ever and I remember seeing the flyer and I just was I don't think I was old enough to like think that I could go over and make it over there or something but um, we kept hearing about this band Bellevue and we're like well there is something going on like you know they're new wave they're punk we don't know um, and um, and then one night, uh, my brother and I were listening to. We used to be able to get K San Radio from San Francisco, late late Friday and Saturday nights, Friday or Saturday nights on the airwaves. If you listened, you could barely hear it. And they would every, I think it was Saturday night. They had a show called The Heretics Hour, and it was these three guys that would play punk rock music, and they played this song that was just amazing. And then they, the guy they back voice the, the voice track, and they said that was a band from Reno called Bellevue. I didn't know there was anything going on in in Reno, and we're like, that's Bellevue, and it was insanely like crazy early snarly Iggy in the Stooges, like guitar driven, like just great stuff. So then the mission became to try to find Bellevue. Like how do we find Bellevue? Where what are they where you know, where do they hide out? You know, do they have like a cool clubhouse that we can go join and so I don't know. Anyway, um eventually everybody just started to kind of uh I guess I guess we we after meeting Tom who lied to us and said and he told us he was a drummer, but he didn't really play drum he hadn't played drums and he didn't have a drum kit. Um, and Cliff Barnell, who, who was the other guy that we used to, he said he could play drums. And so we were like, well, maybe, you know, one of, maybe you can play drums and you could be our manager. You know, we were already thinking, like, we need a manager. And so there was talk, and for a while Tom was going to be the manager, and then, you know, Cliff was going to be the, 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 the drummer, but then, Cl you know, Cliff didn't, he wasn't going to get the drum set. So Tom went out immediately and got a drum set and learned how to play within weeks. I mean, he learned how to play a beat so quickly. And... Um, it was purely from he and I talking, saying, let's, let's try to be as, at least as fast as the Dills and the Ramones, which nowadays, if you think about it, they, neither band was very fast, but that to me was the fast, those are the fastest bands, and that's what we wanted to sound like, is that furious fast thing. So Tom practiced, practiced, practiced. D D Cliff sort of became our manager, even though there was nothing to manage. Essentially, he, he was kind enough to let us practice in his basement over off uh, Ralston. We would just go to his house and practice all day, all night. <laughs> and um, try to get, just get songs. I had some songs from the X-Band era, and um, I was realizing, you know, just ridiculously naive, stupid lyrics about, you know, just dumb, just dumb stuff. Not even, not even, I'm glad it's not, some of it's recorded, but it's buried. Um, but yeah, so we just started to form, form the band. The idea at that time wasn't that there we could even, we didn't even know what the, like the idea of a scene didn't even cross our minds because we didn't know how that worked. We were just used to going to rock concerts and uh, hanging out with a bunch of people in line for hours and someone passing you a joint and someone throwing a frisbee across. You know, just, we, we, there, there was like a scene, but it wasn't really a scene. It was just sort of like, you didn't really connect with anybody. But we were hearing about this stuff going on in other parts of the country and other parts of the world and we just, we just got the bug. We just thought, there's gotta be more people like this and if we all kind of hang out together, we can do something together, you know? So, um, I don't know. Am I, am I rambling on too much? Is it too? Okay. Um, you'd give me the sign, right? You'd give me the ramble sign? Right. Um, yeah, so, okay. So, anyway, we're talking, and we're like, all right, how do we get gigs? Well, again, nobody was going to book us. Well, I think we tried to go to some of the clubs, and they just said, nope, we're not doing that, that kind of stuff. We were also um, sort of, uh, I think Tom was the only one that was over 21, uh, and eventually his younger brother, Jim, uh, otherwise known as Dim Menace, joined us because I didn't want to be the singer. I wanted to just play guitar and write the songs. And, um, and so we kept trying to get somebody else to sing. And it, you know, it would, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But uh, we, we had songs and we were ready to go. And it was just a matter of trying to find a place to, to book us. Um, 
somehow, and I, this is always this has been disputed a little bit, but I thought Cliff had gotten us the gig at the Townhouse, which was a, a club, kind of a what, like a biker bar, kind of a rednecky pool high pool. I don't even know what it was. Does anyone remember the Townhouse? What was, was it? It was like a top forty bar, maybe. It was everything. <laughs> Well, exactly, because they booked us, and we weren't ready. We weren't very good, um, but they uh, somehow the the show uh, later on it was said that my little brother Steve somehow talked to the guy and got the gig for us, which could have happened. But we got a gig. Uh, we opened for a band called Mick Evans Band uh, on March second, nineteen eighty, and uh, just uh, it was such a crazy show. We prior to the show. Uh, we, you know, this was back before, like, the band, each band had their own van, and everybody kind of came to the show together. It was like we were calling, what time are you getting there? What time should I get there? I don't know. So we, Steve and I get to the show, and we see you guys. We see Joan and Bessie, and we see, my sister's there. So were you there? Did you make it to that first show? Sorry, I'm not trying to be insider-ish. I'm just trying to, this is, I haven't seen some of these guys in so long. It's great to see them. Uh, anyway, just a, you know, a smattering of people showed our family members, friends of, of Tom's and Dim's, and, and you know, it was like, there was a, a news, some one of the local news uh, TV stations showed up. I guess the word got out, like, we better check this out. It's, it's invading Reno. And they interviewed, um, they interviewed uh, people, and I remember, I, I still can hear the voice. They interviewed a girl, and they said, uh, what did you think of the show? And she just goes, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I have the audio. I still have the audio from that that I recorded from the TV. I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we played, and uh, it was crazy. I don't, you know, it was just one of those things where, like, just having... Uh, so Bessie, you showed up in a nurse's outfit, I think. You had a nurse's outfit, and you were wearing crazy glasses. You guys both might have been wearing nurse's outfits. I'm wearing a lunch bag. A, a, lunch, a lunch bag? Luggage. luggage bag. All right, so Joan was wearing a luggage bag. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's kind of... Really, in a nutshell, that's, in my opinion, that's where it all started. That's where uh, all of us, those people that were there, were like, all right, we're the, we're the crazy black sheep of this little weird town we live in. Let's do something. And so from that point on, we just started to make an effort, I think, in staying in touch with each other and, and just trying to kind of, you know, collaborate or whatever. And, and uh, Bessie and Joan, who ended up having starting their own band shortly after all-girl band called The Rex, who were phenomenal and highly underrated and way ahead of t their time uh, were our biggest our biggest uh, just source of, of, of friggin support and inspiration like we would it's so much so that when we would start playing out of town and play in front of mostly male dominated uh, crowds it, it freaked us out because it was like wait we're all the girls we you know there's always girls at our shows so that's kind of where it all I think it all started as far as us thinking that there was like a scene and um, and uh, at that point, just uh, it's kind of kicked off. There was had, there was a lot of basement shows, a lot of basement, sh you know, like not a lot, but a few basement shows where we were all kind of rallying. And I don't remember whose houses they. Well, I do sort of like the Rad House. Uh, there was a place called the Rad House, which is over in uh, off of what's the street, the Sutro, over by the Seven Eleven. All right. Uh -huh. Monticello? Yeah, Desna was the street. Desna was the... There was these people, uh, some, some people uh, that, that in my mind were just like stoner hippie people, I guess, but I'm, of course, not, I shouldn't be labeling anybody, but they were just nice people. And they said, hey, we have this house and there's this weird crappy back house. Where you got, what do you guys want to do with it? And so somehow we decided to build a stage and do soundproofing and it turned into the first sort of official punk rock venue that we knew about, about it called the Rad House. And who named it? Who named it? I, no, I didn't name it. Did I? <laughs> Yay! All right. <laughs> so it was this. Yeah. So so it was uh, underground. It lasted for not even what, a year, little, not even a year, and it was just crazy because uh, we were just doing shows there as much as we could. Bands like the Thrusting Squirters. Uh, God, I mean, <laughs> let me say it again. Bands like the Thrusting Squirters. <laughs> 
who were great, by the way, friggin' great band. But anyway, uh, so we started, that would became our center point, like our social hub, more or less. And it was the only place that, like, we weren't going to get kicked out or get our butts kicked. And, and the neighborhood at the time was kind of sketchy, but the neighborhood kids just didn't care. They didn't care. They were like, eh, whatever, you know, like, they, they didn't seem to mind it. We didn't, I don't remember anyone calling the cops on us or anything. It was just like, sort of like, whatever. So that was our thing. And we were uh, lucky enough to have like, well, people like Cliff and, and those guys who were in, getting in touch with bands like Black Flag, DOA, Young Canadian, Subhumans. Who else came through? I mean, it, Social Unrest, The Lude, just bands from out of town who were uh, willing to come up and, and just play for this very tiny little scene that they had no idea what, you know, it wasn't about money and it wasn't about glory. They just were like, let's do this, you know? So they come up and it was huge for us because just the, for the fact that anybody would come to Reno, Nevada and, you know, it, just even care, it was so huge for us young kids that just wanted to uh, just uh, rock in our own special way. Um, <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. But uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of the, the thing. And, and uh, from that point, it was like, after we lost the Rat House, uh, there was a lot of, uh, I think what, what was good about that is that a lot of people picked up on the idea that you could put on your own shows. Uh, Bessie and Joan were doing the, 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 really the first zine, punk zine called Paranoia, which documented everything that was going on. Uh, Sue, Sue, I mean, Sue, my sister, who's not here tonight, she had zines. Everybody had zines, which was cool. Like, where did we get? I guess you guys probably maybe heard about it. I, I didn't, zines were like a weird, fanzines were like a weird thing because I, you know, I mean, I, I was getting them whenever I'd go out of town, but the idea that we could have our own local zines just was like, I think it was just like, hey, why not? So, um, but that would bring, that would kind of kind of tie in the social thing. You could read about yourself in the gossip column and that was kind of fun. See your photo of you doing something, balancing something stupid on your head or whatever. But I don't know, I just tied in the, this idea, I know I'm almost done here, uh, that you could, uh, you could get together with like-minded people and not be exactly the same and uh, and just just have something that that you uh, were passionate about that not a lot of people at least outside of that were and uh, it's really funny now to think about it because of how much punk rock has influenced life in general I mean not just music but you know fashion art food I mean everything is you know you can watch TV for 20 minutes and you, you can see something that you know is directly in inspired and influenced by punk rock so to, to be a part of, to get to be a part of something like that in such a special way, we had to fight and, and really, really work for anything that we were able to pull off in this town. The city didn't want to support it. Um, we would have never been sitting in this beautiful room, you know, in 1980 doing, talking about this if, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's, it blows my mind. So, um, I guess that's about all I can, I can say on it. I don't, I don't really, I don't know, uh, there's not really not much more to say. It's, uh, but thank you guys, and, and, and Bessie, thank you so much for tirelessly putting all this together and the energy and the love that you, that I wasn't sure you still had for it. <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, to the Holland Project and to the Nevada uh, Museum of Art for letting, for even giving us a chance to get to kind of come in here and uh, do what, we, what we're doing right now. Um, this coming up right now, um, um, shall I do the introduction? Gary, Gary Elam. Yeah, Gary Elam was doing a uh, photo work for, it was of the, the Gazette, Jim? Sparks Tribune, that's right. I always, okay. And uh, was just always taking photos everywhere. And I remember being sort of annoyed because I was always going, who is this guy? Why is he taking photos? Like, I thought it was like he was stealing our souls at the time, you know? And uh, until, until I think the first time you, sent, you gave us a, a photo that we got to use for our promo photo. And then I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Uh, but anyway, uh, he was, uh, while well, we were all doing our thing and trying to be cool or whatever, Gary was documenting in, in a beautiful way what was happening in Reno at that time, and it was very, you know, uh, it's j knowing that uh, he still has possession of that stuff, and especially this short film, I, I didn't even know it existed. So, uh, I don't know, Gary, uh, <laughs> no? You're like, <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's hear for Gary Elam, please, because <laughs> such a major contribution to what we did in our little punk rock scene. Who's next? <laughs> Gary, Gary. 
<laughs> yeah. Gary Elam. <laughs> Bessie, help me remember here. We never have found this unless Bessie had driven up to Eugene and made me go down into our basement garage and dig through boxes, and there it was. This Super 8 film, hadn't seen it in decades, so here it is. Uh, 13 minutes, uh, I was just informed by my friend Tommy Glogovac, that's probably about 10 minutes too long. <laughs> so, anyway, black and white, uh, Super 8, and... Uh, I and it was, you, you, so we, I, real quick, just so I remember, yeah. we drove down in Jim Diedrichson's Mustang, you were in the passenger side? Yeah. And you were filming? Filming right there, yeah. yeah. That was probably the, behind the whole idea is that Jim D had a beautiful uh, 64, 65 Mustang, and it was kind of like, uh, okay, seven seconds, has got a gig, uh, let's do a road trip yeah. and uh, film it. So that's what happened. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so that's it.
So now we're going to open it up to a q and A. I'm going to ask um, Kevin to come back up and have a seat, and also Gary, if you can come up, and we're going to ask a few questions about um, making the movie, and then at whatever people in the audience. So I thought what I'll do is ask each one of them uh, a question just to kind of get it started, and then um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and try to speak loudly, and we'll see what they have to say. So I want to ask Gary first. Gary, as a journalist coming in who had shot a lot of music, um, lots of rock stuff, he's got actually this really cool set of pictures in the exhibit of ACDC. Um, but he had been, you've been to a lot of shows. Can you talk a little bit about um, the difference that you saw um, between what you were shooting at these big arena shows and when you went to the Rad House? And then I also thought because um, your close friend Jim D worked on the movie with you, if you could speak a little bit about his involvement and um, the music that he created for this film. Jim D was really the filmmaker and editor. I think he was, you know, really the talent behind filmmaking, and he was my best friend then, and uh, really just a monster guitar player too. And in your band later, was that sometime later? But um, the difference, well, I would say, would be, you know, going to punk rock shows was that it was. Uh, Geez, you were just knocked around a lot. <laughs> uh, you couldn't use a tripod for sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so if you could get on stage, that was good. Otherwise, it was just kind of like uh, every man <laughs> for himself out there. Um, so you know how it was. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you, uh, did you get to see Bellevue play a lot? Did you get to see them? Oh, yeah, quite a bit, yeah. They were like, weren't they such yeah. an elusive band? <laughs> they were like one of those bands you heard of, but you didn't get a chance to see until later. Yeah, we, I think we all saw their last show there, and that summer. I got the same one. Yeah. That's Tommy. Hey, Tommy. Hey, buddy. Tommy. <laughs> Yeah, we, we we did it. There was a, a later Bellevue, Seven Seconds Bellevue show at this place called Cindy's. I think that's what you're talking yeah, about. I have, a t I have a live recording of that, actually. I think they were like, in between every song, there were like tiny riots going on and like between people, there were fights and all crazy stuff going on. <laughs> Battle wounds. Uh, Jim was brilliant, man. That's great, man. And I remember practicing with you guys back in the old days. Yeah, yeah. Very fun. That's right. Yeah, we recorded at your house. We recorded in your in your garage. In the garage. Yeah. Yeah. We. we uh, and it, we, it was like we killed two birds with one stone. We, we recorded and then we got to do a photo session in uh, yeah. Greaves' Cadillac. And, right? Yeah, I think <laughs> that's why the cops came by a couple times. Little, it happened. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to ask Kevin a question. Um, Kevin, so I, uh, the song that was chosen for this film and is actually one of my favorites was a song called Racism Sucks. And you can hear at the end, there's the lyrics are like, kill, kill the KKK. It's a pretty subtle song. Yeah. And we were trying to... <laughs> But, you know, for a teenager to be exposed to something that like that was pretty mind-blowing and it was extremely passionate. Um, 
I just wanted to ask you about your influences. Like, what were you listening to? What kinds of uh, bands were you listening to? And what were some of your influences? Because it seems like one of the things that Seven Seconds really uh, did differently is that their songs were, your songs and your lyrics were really, uh, there was uh, meaningful. And so that they, they, there was a lot, all kinds of um, punk and hardcore bands with a wide range of lyrics, certainly not all political. But I wanted to ask you, what bands were you listening to? What were your influences? What kind of got you down that path and attracted you to the types of lyrics that you wrote back then and that kind of still continued to this day? I, I think the biggest band was The Clash because they were the first band that I considered sort of a political, like the Sex Pistols had songs, the anti-government songs, but I thought it was just like, they, they sang them in the way that I thought we would have sang, sung them if we were like railing against the Queen, but The Clash had this element of, they seemed educated and, and, and like they knew what they were talking about, and I was just, I was young enough to where I didn't, I had a lot of friends of mine that were just very, uh, they grew up, they were raised a certain way, and there was a lot of, uh, they, they would make racist attitude, uh, uh, com uh, comments, and it never sat well with me because I grew up, my mom was always very liberal and a hippie from, lived in Berkeley, and was very, we'd always talk to us about things like racism and, you know, respecting people of all colors and, you know, backgrounds. Uh, so it was, it was sort of me trying to, uh, for me, writing lyrics like that was just me trying to sort of tap into my own inner weird conscience and find out where I stood with things. And so when, when punk showed a political side and it was like really in your face, I just thought, this is what I, this is what I want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. so, and, and I didn't want to mince words at the time. I just felt like, uh, I didn't want to try to be cutesy or anything because I, I didn't, well, I couldn't. I wasn't that clever. But I just wanted to, I wanted it uh, established, I wanted to put the word out that if you have any uh, question as to where we stand, you shouldn't because this is where we stand. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it came back to bite us a few times, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. And any other bands that you can note that, like, what were you listening to? Oh, that time? Uh, the Dills from San Francisco, well, from San Diego originally, but they were super political. I mean, they 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 called themselves straight up communist punk, you know. And I thought that was like, whoa, who who's who's got the balls to do that in 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 nineteen, you know, and where our enemy is 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 the Soviet Union, and you know, like I just thought, wow, that's. But it appealed to me because it was so brave. I thought, I mean, now it, you think that was stupid, you know. But uh, they were willing to just be. They were just willing to just get out and talk about things and and question things. And so they were a big influence. The Dills were mm -hmm. their uh, song. All of their songs, Class War, and all that stuff, just. Uh, been, a lot of the Dead Kennedys, you know, there was a lot of political stuff popping up in the Bay Area that mm -hmm. really got into my DOA, you know, DOA were hugely influential to our early uh, seven seconds. I was um, interviewing Ian McKay of Minor Threat for the show to get some quotes from him, and he had mentioned that Sham 69 was really big in DC. Was that an influence for you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they were sort of, Sham was like a band that you could relate to because they, they just seemed like guys that liked, you know, foot soccer and they go to the bar at the pub and hang out with their friends. They, it was all about community and brother and sisterhood. That's what I liked about them. They, mm -hmm. they sort of helped spark this idea that we can unite to, to have, you know, do things, do creative things and just go out and have fun at a, at a punk rock show. A um, little less political in my mind, but mm -hmm. yeah, that was. Uh, and then what about the about Crass. Crass was a band from England that were anarchists. They lived in communes and... Yeah, they were uh, the real deal. What? They were the real deal. <laughs> Did they influence you at all? Uh, probably. Steve, my brother, was yeah, really into Yeah, I remember he was really You could see it all over his... You know, they, were, they also sort of that stencil uh, lettering stuff that was always... I always uh, credit the Crass for bringing that into punk rock and hardcore. But yeah, I think so. They were probably... A little, uh, they had some influence on us too. It was hard to relate to them because they were, they were specifically talking about you know Maggie Thatcher and you know all of this stuff. And so, but you could kind of do the same thing and just uh, you know switch it out with Ronald Reagan at the time because you know we were sort of that was our our guy that we rallied around to try to to try to bring down man, and uh, <laughs> we did. No, I'm just. Yeah. <laughs> He's not here anymore. <laughs> We know punk rock did it. <laughs> I have a question for Derek. I um, also made some great movies at the time, and a bunch of us did. But I had, uh, and I don't know what you shot that on, but it didn't seem, it seemed really, I mean, you got all kinds of cool texture. Obviously, you're an artist and a photographer, you know how to do that. I always had my parents, like our home movie camera, and it came with a really bright light. So I'm guessing. 
Well, we didn't use any lights. Um, Well, our secret was um, <clears throat> we went out to J.C. Penney um, Outlet Store in Sparks. I don't know if anybody remembers where that was, and we were we were looking for some props. Jim, Dean, and I were wandering around there and uh, saw a whole shelf of uh, black and white film, Tri X. It's kind of a fairly fast film, and uh, so you can shoot without lights, but it's real grainy. Um, you know, we're not trying to be artistic. It was all we had. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, and even the second, when you go to the live stuff, it gets really clean looking and, and really, I, I'm amazed at how I wasn't, yeah. didn't even seem that grainy, like when you go to yeah. the live shots. Of, that was all done at the Mabui Gardens in San Francisco, right? Was that? Yeah. In 81? Yeah. 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 So let's see. Let's take some questions up there. Man in the hat, let's do it. Speak up. Gary, I was just going to ask you, was, was Bellevue's first gig uh, at, on Thanksgiving in 1979 at the Virginia City Railroad Depot for my wedding? <laughs> I can answer Very, that one. No. It was it? <laughs> no. His no? brother said they started, pl they started playing punk rock in 76 or 77, so... And you cannot find know. Bellevue stuff anywhere. Like on the internet, where you can find everything. I've searched high and low. You can't find any of their stuff. Like you know, somewhere like popping up on YouTube or something. They had that song. You guys had that song, "Horrible Herbie." It, that was one of the most amazing songs. Like, do you remember the song? Oh, I would love to get a hold of that. I would pay for that. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, they were really the best over there. Yeah. I, I'm, I just got part of that. I'm sorry. Uh, modern of food, like oh, you know, just in like uh, in 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 uh, like illustrate like graphic design, like it just in so much stuff. Like it just, you know, uh, the th the way that we used to make flyers and and fanzines and 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 design our record covers. You know, it, sometimes it liter literally came down to just sitting at Kinko's all night, just cutting, you know, stuff, newspaper clippings or, or whatever. And, and it seems silly, but, you know, nobody, I mean, there, now there are like coffee table books with just nothing but that stuff. Back then, you know, I used to get crap all the time from people at Kinko's. Why are you doing, you're spending all this time, like, you can do that, do that, do that on the c computer. And I was like, computer is what rich people have. I don't have a computer. I can't, you know. <laughs> So yeah, it was, uh, I just see it in every, I just see, I mean, even like logos, I'm like, that was stolen from the dead Kennedy, you know what I mean? Like, it's happened to my band. There's, there's been things where they just, they kind of screwed around a little bit, and it's like, and I've had people go, like fans go, are you okay with this? And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I can't, I'm not gonna sue somebody, you know? But it just in, just in general, I think like, I, it also, like if you know behind the scenes, you know they don't like on in movies and TV and radio and all facets of media, these people that grew up listening to, to punk rock and it, that mentality, they kind of, they held on to it. And even if they're professionals and they're doing all this professional stuff, they still have a little bit of that creeping in, you know, it, it, it fuels what they do. And uh, there's no denying it, it's there, you know, you can see it and feel it, I think, you know, whether it matters to mainstream America or not, it doesn't matter. Let's see, who else has a question here? I have a question. Um, I grew up in the late 80s, hardcore scene in New York, Connecticut, and it seems like every band is a sing along to the light out the crowd. Sometimes you felt like half the set was sung by the crowd. Yeah. It was so empowering. Yeah. And inclusive and amazing, and it really set the song apart from everything else. Yeah, like, absolutely. It shows like half the scene was by the crowd. Yeah. The first band I saw do that was Half the Set, and I was wondering if you guys, did you guys start that? Or was that I, I don't know if we started, but I just did it because it gave my voice a rest, and I could, no, I'm just kidding, but, no, it was a big part of it, I don't think we started, I think it just, uh, I think, uh, I don't know who started, you know, probably Minor Threads, I mean, it, the, the, all the bands that we grew up really loving were always very, uh, Include like they want they would bring you I like, remember black flag would get up and they would let you there was nothing better than st Everybody would stand on the side of Greg and the guitar player in hopes that they could play Louie Louie like we would just stand in a friggin line So we, we could be you know, we get to grab the, the, the Dan Armstrong and play and it was like that was amazing, you know, because 
it, again, it was sort of like what I was saying earlier, where if you went to go see, I mean, I, I, I loved going to concerts, big concerts and seeing all these big bands, but th there really wasn't, I remember just going to, like, to Day on the Greens, and you were like, my, it felt like a mile away from everybody, and there was no connection to the music, really, other than just maybe you were stoned, and it was like, oh, this is great, it's Led Zeppelin, but... <laughs> You know, at a show, you were part of it, you know? And, and I, I say this all the time, our shows really have always been, if the crowd is sucky and there's no energy, we're not, chances are we're not doing very well that night either. Like, we're not having fun, because it's, it's a big connection to that, so. so. Let's see, who else has a question? Tommy? <laughs> hmm. Did you ever see Gary Elon? <laughs> I didn't. We stayed at a hotel one night. And I remember waking up and Gary was just hovering over us with it. No, I've never seen that. I just, that's a lie. <laughs> no, he's always been a sweetheart. And I always used to think, you know, I, for the longest time, I remember hearing the name Gary Elam, and I, and, and I, and, but I didn't quite know who it was because he would never get up and go, hey, it's me. Like, I, you know, like I was like, hey, Kevin Second. But, uh, yeah, and that was always a, a huge part of why it was so, well, also, too, knowing that, you know, uh, that, that I always had this feeling that at your home or at your office there was just all of, this, all of these little trinkets of goodness and, you know, so it's been confirmed. <laughs> uh, Roman. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I was my wife and I were talking about that coming up. So uh, back in back in that time, there was all uh, a lot of the uh, bigger cities had little nicknames like you know San Francisco was Frisco hardcore punk rock. San Diego actually for a while it was Slow Death. They had like this nickname Slow Death. I don't, like, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. And I was like, we we need a nickname. And no one I knew. Uh, would play along. Like, no one would, like, go along. I'm like, let's think of something. And they'd be like, no. Like, everybody just thought it was silly, you know? So I kept saying, if I just think of something silly enough and just keep saying it or write it on my jacket, somebody will go, they'll mimic it, you know? And so that's kind of, I think, what happened. And then we just used it a lot in our our records. And then when there was a scene here, people would, some people really, like, rejected it. Like, there were people that were just like, fuck that, you know, like, but there were people that, uh, can I say fuck in a museum? <laughs> uh, there were people, though, that, that uh, embraced it. And I think it was just, I just wanted us, for us, it was, like, really important, because we were going out of town a lot to shows, like San Francisco and L.A. and Sacramento, and it, it, back then it was a big deal to try to sort of stake your claim and hang with the big boys, you know, like, because if you went there, like, back then, San Francisco, you know, had, like, you know, like, if L.A. came up to San Francisco, they would just devastate L San Francisco. Like, they would just take over the club because the kids in L.A. were nuts, you know? So we would come down and think, we can hold our own, and of course we couldn't, but we, we, wanted, to, mm -hmm. we wanted to at least fly the, the Reno flag. So Skino was a dumb nickname that just stuck. And it's in the uh, Urban Dictionary, I found out. Somebody pointed the... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, everybody had their, there was like little factions, and, and the thing is, is, you know, later on I came to sort of detest that mentality, but I liked it because it, when it was friendly, it was just sort of our way of like, just sort of setting up our own thing. Like, everyone knew when Reno was in, you know, at the show. I remember going to Sacramento and we played, and there was like 15 of us, and everybody was like, oh, it's those Reno troublemakers, and I, I was so excited about that. I was like, yes, we're troublemakers, we're making people, you know, but, uh, the funniest thing, I think, oh, real quick, is that there was a, a group of kids in L.A. that actually was, remember the kids that came up and they were, we made films with them? They were little, Eugene, I, there were two kids that used to come up and, and we made these little short, wacky, like, horror films. Anyway, they came up and I remember them, they wrote, wrote a letter to me and they said, they said, how do you feel about us starting a Skino HC gang in Long Beach? And I was like, have at it. There's not enough gangs down there. You, you, you need a new one. Call it Skino HC. Let's see, I noticed you had a question. That was the short, yeah, that was our... That that, 
uh, that's a such a boring, lame story. There's no real. I don't. I don't remember to be honest. I've made up twenty stories what that it means, just so that it sounds better. Uh, I don't remember honestly. I don't. I think we just wanted a. We didn't want a name that sounded like the Spits or the Shits, or we just wanted something that didn't sound like. Uh, stereotypically punk rock, but it sounded fast and quick. And I, I like it because I remember talking to Ian, and he's like, "Yeah, we used to think that it was like the most mysterious name for a punk band." And I thought, "Mission accomplished." You You're wondering how many photos are are in the exhibit? How you many? Mean? How many are never before seen? Uh, oh, how many? Yeah. How many? Are, how about how? How many are in the exhibit, and how many of them have been published? How many photos have of? you taken? No, I'm just <laughs> I don't remember. Um, really hard to say. Uh, we have what, like twenty five or thirty? Twenty five or thirty at the show that you can see tomorrow night, and. Um, Maybe several hundred more, probably, at least. And a lot of them that you'll see haven't really been out on the internet or in a newspaper or anything. So a lot of them he, I think, printed for the first time, didn't you? Some of them? Oh, yeah, some, yeah, for the yeah. first time. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to you, Bessie. Yeah, we, I went up there and I was like, Dick Harry, what do you have? And I was, he was like down in the basement. She's I'm just like, relentless. Oh, okay, when's he coming up? And he'd come up with all these, like, BB King and tell me all these great stories. And I'm like, where's the punk rock stuff? <laughs> 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 but he's, yeah, so that was really fun. Okay, who else has another question? Yeah, over here. I'm an old hippie too now. I think we heard that too, and then there was something about the JFK thing. There was seven sec. Like there's been, we feel have sent us that stuff, and I've just, I've just taken it and said, okay, we'll use that next time somebody asks me that. <laughs> I have. We we used to, our old roadie used to actually. I'd say, do you want to take this question? And he would just give a new story every single time to the interview, and it was kind of cruel, but it was fun. I have a question, Kevin. Uh, the Reno scene as it grew, um, there was. Uh, something that I thought was really, um, really fun about it is the practical jokes we would play on people. Do you remember any of them? And can you tell a few of those uh, oh. practical jokes we played? I just, I, I remember a few bands getting, like a, a traveling bands would get, really get the business. Like we, we would, we'd like everything from, uh, they'd show up in town and then we'd sit them down and go, we have bad news guys. Uh, you're not going to actually play tonight. Would you guys mind lip syncing the set? And, and we're talking about like what agnostic front, like New York, like tough New York guys that would just beat your ass in a heartbeat. But, and then, uh, there was, I mean, there's been a few Like we, we had some guys that stayed at our house and sparks and we, <laughs> we set it up to where I was, I I showed up and I'd put a, I, I snuck some test pressings and some records in one of our visiting buddies' bags and then somebody accidentally stumbled on it like, you tried to steal these records, how dare you, you're staying at our house, we offer, and then it just <laughs> stupid stuff. Right? What else are you going to do but mess with your friends, you know? <laughs> there was a ton. You guys, what you, you guys were the king, you and Joan were the kings of that. You guys, ah, you you guys were did all that You pretty good stuff. up there. Um, yeah, what was another one that I remembered that... Um, that was, that honestly, the, the sense of humor that everybody seemed to have growing up here was always, I was always impressed by that because I think you had to have a strong sense of humor and a really bent sense of humor. Like now it's cool. You guys have actual good city to live in. Like it's not just all about, you know, well, I mean, you know, like I, I lived here for 12 years and, and it just was like when I left, I just, I felt like empty. I had no, I didn't, I couldn't do anything anymore. And so... My closest friends who I grew up with here always are still really funny and quick and just, 
I don't know. I like it. Except that guy. He's not so funny. Well, he didn't grow up here, so he doesn't. I remember one that uh, this these uh, people who had a fanzine called The Leading Edge stayed. I, Kevin and I lived together and with his girlfriend for a while in an apartment. And when they came, we took their fanzine and put it over the toilet paper roll. We ripped it up. <laughs> 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 just uh, hilarious yeah. stuff. Oh, so funny. Oh, my God. And we were just... And then we just tried to... So we, bored. Oh, my God. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So who else has a question? <laughs> Burning question. Okay, uh, back there with the beard. Um, so who, who was booking shows and how were you bringing bands in? Like, was it the arena scene? Yeah, well, Cliff, Cliff Varnell, who I talked to earlier, talked about earlier, had, he was, he first started doing DJ, he would DJ, he would just bring some turntables and talk to like uh, Porta Subs or somebody and say, hey, can I spin punk and new wave stuff, and they would let him, you know? So he did that at a few places, and then we would sort of rally around that. And then um, I think, I mean, Cliff may have been the first one who booked the shows at the Rat and House. And I think Tom had a lot of Tom, connections. Yeah, Tom, Tom Borgino, who was original drummer, yeah. Seven Seconds, and then went on to be in Section 8 and Cow Skulls. Yep. He had a lot of connections out of town. And those guys were just networkers. Like, they would just go to other shows in the Bay Area, and they, were, they got tight with, you know, Dead Kennedys, DOA, and all of those bands. I think they just would say, hey, why don't you come up and play Reno? And, they'd, and the bands would say, okay. You know, it was because everybody wanted to play. And those bands, especially DOA, Black Flag, they were just pioneering. They were playing anywhere. They would go out for three months and just tour and play every crap, crappy little town. So Reno, you know, was became a part of their regular thing, which was you know, great, because it, it said a lot about the scene and how much, you know, people loved it. And, and yeah, yeah, so yeah, I think and Cliff was, and Tom were really huge. That was in the real early days. Can you talk a little bit more about the, inter, or the national and international connection that happened, like, say, starting, you know, I noticed just by re-looking at the flyers, you seem to set up a lot of shows, like in 82, 83, yeah, there was, it, it, it seemed like there was a lull for a while, mm -hmm. and we were doing uh, things like we would go rent a warehouse. I remember we brought this, the band from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Decroitzen, and they were touring, and they called us up and said, hey, we want to play, and we, we booked them in a, like a 10 by 20 uh, storage shed up on Sutro. There was like a, a, a self-storage thing, and uh, we... <laughs> There would be one plug-in, which was you had to unscrew the light bulb on top, put a, one of those things you could plug in, and then that would power all the amps, and then we'd just play until we'd get stopped. Uh, just the cops would come, you know? But that was a thing where we just, because uh, we would go to, like, I would go to different little clubs that were, I'd go, all right, who's really, like, just not doing well? Like, who's desperate and would just let us come in and at least do one show? Uh, Duncan's Pub, which is now Shays? Mm -hmm. Is that Shays? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, so I played there, I uh, did a solo show let, uh, a little while ago, and no one realized, like, that Black Flag, like, so many great bands played at that place, and everyone was like, really? I didn't know that. But who did that, sh who did those shows? I, that's that's those. probably, I don't know, Cliff, probably. <laughs> if anybody here did those shows, please tell us. <laughs> please stand up. <laughs> but we just learned from each other how to do shows, like, we would, we would just... Uh, talk amongst ourselves and say, "Well, he did it. I can do it." So, and uh, and there was there was also like because uh, with well, you're with with Bessie's zine with paranoia that you guys were communicating with people that over in like friggin' Finland and Italy and all that you know. So it wasn't just national; it was like international, and uh, it was really easy to connect with people. The world just felt. Well, it feels smaller because of the internet now, but back then it was through scene reports and the in maximum rock and roll and that kind of stuff. It felt more intimate. I yeah, feel like, sure, you know. Yeah, we um, we actually wrote letters to each other. Yeah, I so you had a question over there. I think I came across them uh, to begin with. Um, I was working at the Sparks Tribune, and uh, a press man there was uh, Jim D. Jim Diedrichson. Everybody called him Jim D. because we didn't know how to spell his last name. <laughs> and uh, he he played guitar, and um, I think eventually played with Kevin. Yeah. And uh, so we'd go together. 
the shows. And uh, uh, just kind of went on from there. I think he was kind of the start of it for me. He was in uh, Bellevue, uh, Castle, Se Section 8. Yeah, he was with Section us for a short period. Section the 8. Wake, Donner Party. Wow. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Probably the well, best guitar player. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He Him and Sean, Sean Greaves, who was in the band Thrusting Squirters, who went on to play with the lewd and... Social distortion. Social distortion. He, uh, those guys were just, they were actual guitar players. They were real musicians. But they were just, I think, I always said that they dumbed it down for, for, the, for the punk rock. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, back there with the hat. Yeah, hey, Gary. John. Do you remember you took me to uh, uh, Seven Seconds Rented the American Legion Hall in Ralston? Yeah, that was a, I yeah. That was one of the best shows I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. That I was a great that. one. Um, really red plate. DOA was there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. I can see the flyer in my head right now. As a matter of fact. <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I go through your life. I remember flyers of shows. I don't remember the exact shows, but <laughs> yeah. Hey, Bessie, I just want to say something about um, the Rex. Mm -hmm. That um, there's another member here. Oh, yeah. Can, can Stand we, up, Joan Stevens. Joan. <laughs> Joan Jackson. Yes, Joan, we can't see you. Yeah. And long before, like, uh, Riot Girl stuff and all that stuff, I mean, it's all great stuff, and I love it, but the Rex are, dude, <laughs> you guys are so ahead of your friggin' time, you don't even know. <laughs> it's amazing. Craft punk. <laughs> it's amazing. It's crazy. <laughs> Let's see. Any other questions? Any burning things? Yep, back there. That's a great idea. No, well, they're musicians. They don't get out much. They just do. Yeah, there's a few. Yes. OK, so Who's here? we have Joan Stebbins. But she's over <laughs> here. And then we have, she wasn't in a band, but Sue, she did a she was thing called. Yeah, Sue was in oh, a band. Oh, she was in a band she called an Anti, Anti and, and Condemned, yeah. Sue. And there's Roman DeSalvo back there, who's no in No Deal. Yay. <laughs> and Bobby, were you ever in a band? Yeah, we called the Rip Tower. The Rip Tower, okay. Mm -hmm. So Bobby Lickby. Really? All right. Well, and that's another thing too, real quick. The skate scene here, the skate, the skate, the kids that were the crazy skaters, the radical crazy skaters that you'd read about in, you know, all the magazines. Uh, the kids that were in Reno were such a huge part of at least helping to make the energy and make it kind of fun and slightly dangerous and just make it feel like it was uh, like unpredictable and great. And I mean, er, from early on, like when the when the young skate kids from Wooster and Hug and all of the high schools were come to the shows, that's when it got fun because yeah, they would. Yeah, it sure did. They were fearless and and uh, they would just do the craziest shit and I, stuff that I would never try to do because I was just too chicken. But I'd watch them. I'm like, man, oh man. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Bobby <laughs> Lichty and Kevin and all the people that are here. Where's uh, where's Randy Iberg? <laughs> Whatever happened to <laughs> Randy Randy Iberg? Is it Randy? Yeah. Yeah, he was he was coming to the shows early on. Crazy. Well. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming tonight, and be sure to head over to the Holland tomorrow, six o'clock, six o'clock, or thereafter, for the rest of the evening, I'm sure. And um, we'll hope to see you here again sometime soon. Thank you so much.